Hi, and welcome to Numerics Video Blog. I'm Jim Jockel of Numerics. And with me today is Satyam Kinchal, our Senior Vice President of our Client Solutions Group. Welcome, Satyam. Hi, Jim. To clear or not to clear? Well, that is the question. And not to be too Shakespearean, I think that's the key question that's going on in the marketplace. And there's a lot of complexity in that. And I know we only have a few minutes, and I think we have more, th more than we need to to talk about at this point. But I really want to just kind of focus on one of the areas that we've uh, covered a lot in our webinars and gotten a lot of client interest in, which has really been around OIS discounting. And maybe just, just to start, you can kind of give us a little bit of history and background of how we got to where we are today. The first thing we must realize is that OIS represents a collateralized rate. And the reason this has become a standard is post-2008, uh, we saw a huge increase in the number of collateral agreements and the number of transactions that were uh, guaranteed by collateral, um, daily collateral posting. And as a result, LIBOR was no longer uh, thought to be the right uh, rate for discounting uh, because the amount uh, of money that people raise for, for funding these transactions, derivative transactions, uh, is typically raised at a rate that is more closely tied to the OIS rate uh, because of the collateralized rate nature of these transactions than to, than to LIBOR. And that's the reason why we have shifted to an OIS discounting. No, but let's start right there. OIS, uh, excuse me, LIBOR, very well established benchmark. OIS, not necessarily the most observable market at this point in time. What kind of challenges are we seeing as a lot of interpolation has to happen just to create these curves? That is so true. LIBOR has existed for over 20 years now and uh, it's the most common benchmark you will see for derivative transactions. But as OIS was always something that existed, but it was never as liquid as LIBOR. Uh, with, with 2008 and post-2008, uh, the use of OIS for these uh, transactions, we have seen more instruments uh, that, that can help to bootstrap OIS curves, but still uh, there is a shortage of liquidity, particularly in the long end. Um, so you can see curves going to 10 years, but, but not much more beyond in most currencies. Also, uh, the OIS rate or OIS-like rates exist only for the major currencies. Uh, they do not exist uh, for many of the emerging currencies, and as a result, uh, there, is a, there is a big question as to what uh, curves have to be used for those currencies. Well, also another question which uh, a lot of uh, we continue to hear about is what about cross-currency deals? How is that being managed? And I think uh, the biggest question at the end of the day is what kind of complexity is being entered into the valuation process that has never been there before? True. The valuation process truly becomes a, a very complex a activity because of these multiple curves that, that, are, exi that are existing out there. Uh, in fact, people refer to curve surfaces rather than curves uh, uh, because of the multiple curves, including repo curves and so on. What is really required to be able to uh, get a handle on these curves accurately and get a handle on the related volatilities are really a whole bunch of additional basis swaps and uh, optionality-based uh, instruments like options on, on spread between OIS and LIBOR or, or similar in order to be able to uh, get a handle on these different risk factors, which simply do not exist today. Uh, this is the reason why uh, most uh, institutions are now trying to go back to more standardized CSAs uh, based on what ISDA has recommended and based on what uh, LCH has also come up with in order to eliminate this complexity uh, in, the, in, the, in the valuation process, in order to eliminate the embedded optionality that exists in these, in these contracts. But now I think it's also important to note Hull and White have come out and they're not necessarily in agreement with all of this in terms of the fundamental issues that are facing quantitative finance. I mean, what, give us a little insight to that debate. The, the, the big challenge is that some of the changes in methodology that have taken place and some of the changes that are already being used in banks break the most uh, basic assumption of modern quantitative finance, which is the risk neutral assumption. And as a result, uh, we see various adjustments uh, like FVA, DVA, CVA, uh, being applied, and and most of these adjustments are actually related to these these concepts of collateralization and funding and counterparty risk, uh, and and while we have a school of thought that says that these uh, 
these assumptions do not actually factor into the pricing, but they are more cost of doing business or they should be handled more at the portfolio level, not at the trade level. Whereas there is another school, another school of thought which, which says that each and every cost has to be attributed to the trade and has to be managed at the trade level. So that's where the, the conflict is and we'll see, we'll see where things go. But most of the uh, advanced uh, institutions are already ap applying these adjustments to the trade rather than just at the portfolio. Well, I know we have a lot more to talk about, and thank you for your time here today. And we will be continuing along this theme to, uh, to clear or not to clear, and getting that down into the consideration of funding. Thank you, and have a good afternoon.